flashing arrow, the shield, the sword, and the weapons of war. Glorious are you, more majestic than the mountains full of prey. The stout-hearted were stripped of their spoil. They sank into sleep. All the men of war were unable to use their hand. And your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both rider and horse lay stunned. But you, you are to be feared. Who can stand before you when once your anger is roused? From the heavens you uttered judgment. The earth feared and was still. When God arose to establish judgment, to save all the humble of the earth. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The remnant of wrath you will put on like a belt. Make your vows to the Lord your God and perform them. Let all around him bring gifts to him who is to be feared. Who cuts off the spirit of princes, who is to be feared by the kings of the earth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. But understand this, <laughs> that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Well, we have a couple things here in epistemology. We talked about truth, but then we also talk about the knowledge of truth, or what do we mean by knowledge? Indeed, one big question would be, can you have knowledge that isn't true? Right? Uh, it's a question of how we understand knowledge. But notice the scriptures say, in Judah, God is known. Now, what does it mean to know God? Is there, are there different ways in which we know things? And then I think one of the um, saddest verses in the Bible, very relevant to our situation, I think. Talking about the godlessness in the last days. And in verse 7, talks about people always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. So it is interesting that someone can be in this always learning, but never really arriving at a knowledge of the truth. We want to arrive the knowledge of the truth. Uh, and so there's a way in which learning can become divorced from actual knowledge of the truth. Or what you're learning, what you're being taught. And uh, sort of the idea also that often comes up is I'm just wanting some kind of new experience. I kind of experience that, experience that, but never arriving at the knowledge of the truth. What a way to look on one's life, look back on it and say, I never arrived. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that through faith in Jesus Christ we can know you. And Lord, help us not to be like those always learning, always maybe gathering little tidbits, but never arriving at the knowledge of the truth. Help us to be different, to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. And Lord, be merciful to them that they might find the truth. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I uh, sometimes slip up on the Lord's Prayer because my wife and I have our morning devotions together. You can say 
morning devotions together, and then we close it with the Lord's Prayer, and we use debts and debtors. Oh, so no, you do it the right way. The right way. Well, it actually is closer. To the oh, that's my donut. No. Yeah, I think so. I asked Jacob to put mine on my chair. Well, that's my chair. No, it came out of my office. <laughs> I have lent it to you. This is my chair. No, <laughs> this is <a> school's classroom. <laughs> Not that we're childish, you know. All righty. So, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Yeah, I had a, uh, a girlfriend, the only gal I dated really very seriously outside of my wife. And, uh, she was a Christian, and her dad was not a Christian, but he was very generous and loved her and everything. And so she would be going to conferences and things. And so she went to him and said, Dad, I want to go to this one conference, this Baptist Christian conference. And he goes, yeah, I'm going to spend this money on these guys. My, my uh, God has a cattle on a thousand hills. And he goes, yeah, but why does he always have to come to my hill? <laughs> <laughs> okay. One thing you may have been lacking, I'm surprised nobody has asked. You have never been given a syllabus for this class. You have no idea what the requirements are. You may have already hopelessly failed this course. Probably. But we'll give you the syllabus now. And actually, that's intentional. The reason is <coughs> we do it is we want to talk about other things first, start getting the ideas about you know, the issues of truth and things like that before you start saying, how many pages is that uh, essay supposed to be? All right. So we got these three or four guys. Nice and syllabi. Hand in the mouth. Still a what? Still a bus. Still a bus. Still a bus. Thank Now I know that's my shoe. I bought it with my money. <laughs> I exchanged money for a good in or a service. Is your shoe a service? Well, the assistance and picking it out and retrieving it from the back is a service. Okay, so this and is the syllabus. Oh, I gotta get these babies on. I'm gonna make All right, um, so. Uh, names of the teachers, uh, we do welcome emails, okay? If you're asking questions. Um, At appropriate times. Yeah, yes. Telephone there, you got my telephone number. Do not call after 9 o'clock. Right? And probably, you know, don't at 10.30 realize you've got an assignment due tomorrow and send me an email. <laughs> it's not necessary, okay? So, anyway, course description. Let's see. Uh, Joe, would you read the course description? This course is one part of the four semester course, quote, Great Ideas. In this semester, the definition and nature of truth and knowledge are investigated. Various theories derived from ancient, medieval, Reformation, and modern thinkers are explored and assessed for their validity with applications to contemporary issues. Okay, very good. So, as you go through this course, you really do want to know what the word epistemology means. That we're talking about and it re re relates to the nature or study of truth and knowledge. Okay, um, and we do read from ancient up to modern thinkers. Um, and I'll stress this, and we've stressed this other times as well. Uh, in, in all these courses, you will be reading the greatest thinkers on these issues in Western civilization. It will be from non-Christians and Christians, pagan authors before Christ, like Plato and Aristotle, um, all the way up to modern atheists, uh, influential atheists, like Friedrich Nietzsche and Jean-Paul Sartre. No, we don't read Sartre. We stop yeah. So it's a wide, wide array of people, and uh, you'll be getting some of the best minds read about these issues. And you can also tell if you hear me say Christian, non-Christian, they're not all going to be in agreement. 
They won't be an anchor. Significant difference. And we'll need to start reading them critically. Uh, so let's look through the course objectives. Jacob, why don't you read the first one? For us? You participate in the great conversation that has taken place over the history of humanity by the greatest minds about truth, knowledge, belief, opinion, and faith. Okay, so this. If you look on this course as a conversation that you're having with great minds throughout history, it'll be a lot better. And you really are entering into a dialogue with them. What is this guy saying? Why is he saying? Is he right? Is he wrong? Why do I think he's right and wrong? Think about dialoguing or conversation with them. And truth, knowledge, belief, opinion, faith. Is, this, is an opinion like belief? Belief the same as faith? Where is truth and knowledge and all of that? Andy, would you read number two, please? The second one. To understand who these authors of the question have influenced the way how we view our time. All right. So some people will say, well, why do we read this ancient author, Plato? What's he got to say today? And then all of a sudden, you'll find out that they're discussing. Someone who says, yeah, you know, truth is kind of whatever works for me. <laughs> and you'll find out that uh, Socrates, Plato via Socrates, shreds that opinion that's still around today. So when you hear that, you'll go, oh, I know where I've read that before. That's an old idea, and it was already clogged. Why are we still talking this way? Good question, right? So, um, we think these ways today because of these uh, men. Uh, Noah, number, the third one, the dialogue. The dialogue with one another and with the philosophers, questioning their presuppositions and arguments and allowing them to question ours. Okay, yeah. So when you read these uh, philosophers, notice I didn't say that, but they are theologians as well. Um, think about it. Why is he saying this? What's his basis or his justification for making this claim? What are his presuppositions uh, and his arguments? Are they good arguments? Um, so question them, but also allow them to question you. This is part of this course's purpose is to all of a sudden start making you think about what you believe or hold to be true. Now, I will say we're a classical Christian school. We want you to be affirmed in the Christian faith, all right? Um, but part of that coming out stronger in your faith is starting to think about it, understand it, to, if somebody disagrees with you, to be able to explain why they're wrong and why you hold what you hold, all right? But you're going to be uncomfortable sometimes. And maybe some of the things that you think is the Christian way of understanding something may end up not actually being that. All right? So just to be uh, open to this uh, and learn from it, this is a great opportunity. But this, is, some of this dialogue with one another and with the philosophers is part of getting dragged out of the We're comfortable with what we already have been taught. We don't have to think about it. Just enjoy those shadows flickering around on the cable. And you're going to be dragged. Try to be doing it positively. So you don't have to be dragged. Um, and with one another. We, we like the interaction, the conversation. I'm sure it's polite and civil, etc. To cultivate theologically informed intellectual and moral virtue. Did we talk about the intellectual virtue? Yes. yes we did, didn't we? Very good. Do you remember one of them? Facility. Ah, uh, that's number two, though. What's number one? Levi. Humility. You know what humility means? Anything? Um, to me, like, you're not actually doing much of my stuff. Yep. So you, you're saying you, you, you don't know what it is. That's humility, isn't it? Admitting what you don't, that you don't know something. Very good. <laughs> okay. So that's humility. I don't know something. Docility. What's that? Willing to learn. Yeah, we talk about teachable. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and so someone who is willing to learn because you can say, yeah, I don't know anything, but I don't care. And so docility, 
virtue, intellectual virtues. And we've been called to love the Lord with our whole mind. So if we're not willing to admit that we don't know things, and we're not willing to learn, we're probably disobeying the first commandment, which Jesus called the greatest commandment. And we all actually have uh, Mortimer Adler reading, and I'm not sure if it's in this reading, but it's a moral obligation to use your mind. It's a gift from God. You will be, and we are, I should say, held accountable for our use of the mind. God. Uh, let's see. Uh, you've already read it. Ethan, the last one there in the course objectives. Develop and defend reasoned, written, and oral responses to the questions, what is truth and what is knowledge? Okay, so you're going to be writing, all right, uh, dialoguing in class, and uh, this is nothing new, but it's the rhetoric school, juniors. We expect you now to begin to explain yourself in written form as well as in oral form. I don't know if you want to add anything to these or. Um, moving to the last one. Well, so we're participating in the great conversation, right? And we can know what, say, Thomas Aquinas thought about these issues because he did what? Wrote it down, right? Um, so when we are, uh, so we read, uh, we discuss, and then we ask you then to write yourselves. Um, this course is a very heavy writing load. Um, Not as heavy as it used to be. It's less than when I was a student. <laughs> it's less than when I was a student. That's for sure. You kids have it so Easy. Um, <laughs> take my mask off, my um, but we ask you to write a lot. We ask you to write well. We will tell you when you're writing poorly. Our goal is to make you, you need to, you're going to become better writers over the course of this class, over the course of this semester, next semester. Um, and so, Decide now that you will become a better writer and a better thinker through this course, and it will help you. Because we have had students that refuse to, to learn, and then they're confused about why they fail. So if you want to actually participate in the great conversation, which is a wonderful place to be and to go and to be involved in, you have to try and get better. And if you try, you will, I promise. Um, so you have to go in, that's the attitude you need when you're going into it. Right? You don't know the answers to these questions. You may not have an answer to these questions yeah. at the end of the course, <laughs> but you'll be better equipped to talk about them. Okay? You, have, you have to have that humility here as you go in. And it's fun. It's fun to argue about this stuff. I really like it. Yeah, so now, course requirements. Written reflection on reading. So you'll be given a reading today. You've got the reader there. We'll give assignments out of that. Pretty much the daily assignment. With each assigned reading, students will answer in written form one or two questions, okay? So at the end of today, we're going to say, read such and such. Here are two questions. Right? And you'll be writing answers to these for the next class period, okay? For an assignment of only one question, where we only ask you one question, the answer will consist of two well-crafted paragraphs. The first paragraph will explain the author's answer to the question, will contain at least four complete sentences and a relevant quotation from the assigned reading, citing the source from the reading. In the second paragraph, which is often the case, students will give their view of the author's answer and the reasons for it, and it should contain at least five sentences. So that's not the most common one, but we complete will. Complete sentences. Complete sentences, yeah. So one question, but there'll be two paragraphs. Mm -hmm. Quite often, really, we'll ask you two questions. So for example, for an assignment of two sets of questions, each answer will consist in Notice here, this is, this is being purposely redundant. 
will consist of a well-crafted paragraph of at least four complete sentences and a relevant quotation from the assigned reading, citing the source from the reading. That sound uh, familiar? Have you heard that already? Yeah, so pretty much every class, uh, you're gonna be writing these paragraphs. They'll be typed and submitted in class, right? Um, at the end of the class period. Now, print it out. Don't email it to us. Yes, print it out. If, if it it's going email. to be late, it's going to be late. We need a, a hard copy for it to not be late. Yeah. Okay, unless you are having to do remote stuff, you got exposed or yeah. diagnosed with COVID or something. Yeah. Okay. So notice the definition of a paragraph. Well, maybe I should ask you guys. You've had rhetoric, right? Yes. Right. yes. What's a paragraph? Whatever you want it to be. Yeah. Well, it consists of one topic. Okay. Uh, which you typically state in the first sentence. Okay. So, say you're talking about one thing, like dogs, but then you start talking about cats, you need to make that a different paragraph. You can't have it in the same paragraph. Okay. All right. So, if you were to write an essay about your dog, Mr. Hmm, what would you say? What would I say about my dog? Yeah, you would give its name, for example. Uh, the dog <laughs> owned by Mr. Boggs. <laughs> <laughs> Tried to help you back. Sorry. <laughs> Stepped on my foot this morning. Oh, he did. But if you have a turtle, oh, wow, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> she was very excited. I let her out. She was very excited to come back in to eat her breakfast. And she stepped on my I just had socks on, she slipped on my foot and really dug her nail out. Oh, yeah, that can hurt. I was very angry. <laughs> Yelled at her and woke up Rowan, but this time. Okay, so Levi I'm gave. A good alarm call. Levi, yeah. <laughs> Levi gave a bit of a definition on paragraphs and how to write them on the topic sentence. Because of the nature of these, they're going to be a bit different. Generally, you know, we'll ask, like, what is Aristotle's. Uh, definition of truth, okay? Five sentences, uh, most, the, probably the easiest way to do these is to begin with the quotation. That's not what you would normally do, but for these, it's a bit different. That way you get it out right away. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a hint. For me at least, there is one quote that, an, that will be the perfect quote to answer the question. It doesn't mean it's the only, yeah. not, it, it's the only acceptable one. But usually when I'm asking you a question, there is, I have in mind one quote. So you put the quote as the first one, right? And then in parentheses, the page number, right? So, um, you know, I ask, uh, what is Aristotle's favorite food? And in his writing <laughs> says, my favorite food is pizza rolls. And so you write, Aristotle says, or Aristotle wrote, my favorite food is pizza rolls. In quote, Par uh, uh, parenthesis, page 29, in parenthesis, in mark, right? Then you say, here's Donald said, you know, pizza rolls are the perfect food to make you a genius. So it makes sense there. So, and then you go on and you explain how that quote answers the question. So that's right? the idea there. And you need at least four. If there is four not a quote in complete sentences, or complete sentences, it's automatically points taken off. You're starting buying the eight ball cup. Yeah, we usually give it's just like 10 points. Five it's, not points. A, it's not a joke when we say this. Yes, no. Five points per paragraph, pretty much is how it works. You have a quotation and two sentences of your own, and a three on that paragraph. At most. At most. And that's, yeah, that's if it's well, you're going to lose well done. The other yeah. thing is, Related to what Mr. Boggs said, you want to pick a quotation that's relevant. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, uh, it should be one that's relevant to the question being asked and then relevant to how you answer it. Okay. We have had students, that there's a quotation there. They found something in Aristotle, but it has absolutely nothing with what's being asked. Okay? In one, those can be fun. Yeah, they are. They're funny, but not helpful to your grade or your thinking. 
the, the other thing is, believe it or not, some students, I probably shouldn't even tell them this, I'm sure they wouldn't do it. Oh, no. Some students, Aristotle's definition is true. And so they'll do two, one of two things. They'll get first paragraph, oh, Aristotle says, look, here's something about truth. That's it. They got it. They don't really look too much at the rest. Or they'll kind of flip through Aristotle and see if he can find the word truth and go that way. There are several problems with that. First problem is um, sometimes when we ask for Aristotle's definition of something or understand, or maybe like say Plato's understanding of reality, guess what? Plato may not say reality anywhere in the uh, essay. You're going to need to figure it out. So word picking is not going to help you. All right. The other thing is a student will have the tendency to, oh, there it is right in the first paragraph. And then that's what they go with. But the trouble is, is that these authors often are developing an argument. So they'll give an initial definition that they'll work with and improve on as they go through the essay. So you need to read the whole piece. Uh, or even worse, as we'll see, you've got a couple problems. Socrates and Plato. Plato writes his philosophy in a dialogue. So we can assume Socrates and Plato are the same in that same interview for our purposes. Okay? But some students will pick up on the other person and say, this is what Plato thinks. Trust me. In a dialogue, Socrates and Plato have a different view than the other ones, all right? So you want to read that. Or you get to Thomas Aquinas, who will start out with objections to his position by others, and then he answers them. And students will say, Aquinas says this, and they're quoting the objection. So read the whole thing, make sure you understand it. And we'll, once again, talk about reading dialogues and, and Thomas's type of uh, Writing. And read with a pencil in hand. Yeah. These, are, these readers are yours. Underline, star, highlight, all that good stuff. And, and frankly, um, well, I'll say this for the next thing, but write them well. It'll, it'll help you as you go along. All right. So uh, those are the kinds you have. And um, we've already said some of this. Uh, students will be informed ahead of time, which you complete for each reading, which we do. Uh, and as Mr. Boggs says, they must be completed prior to class and typed on a separate sheet of paper. And I will say, when we started out doing this, uh, you know, like say it was, when does this class start? 10.10? You see somebody coming in at 10.08, madly trying to write something down for their reflection. So typing it actually stops that. You gotta do it. They may you may madly type it at six in the morning or something or <laughs> midnight, but that's a whole other issue. So blame those who came before you. <laughs> All right, participation points. Skyler, could you read this section for us? Mm -hmm. Thank you. The bridge comes from participation, which is absolutely essential for the success of the class and a crucial element in the rhetorical stage of the CPLS overall educational program. Students will receive a daily grade based on the in class discussion. Student participation will be evaluated on the basis of the following aspects of their classroom performance. These are listed in descending order of importance. Significant comprehension of and interaction with the ideas of the reading and their implications, understanding of the author's development of his argument, attentiveness to the classroom discussion of both the teachers and fellow classmates, knowledge of the basic content of the reading, preparation for class by having the Bible reading and written assignments ready at the beginning of class. Points will also be deducted for disruptive behavior. Okay, so notice here, first of all, should have pointed this out. The um, written reflections are worth 20% of your grade. <clears throat> now, once again, occasionally you have a, you know, you, you mess up or something, don't do so well, but there are so many of them, it's not gonna hurt you that much. If you mess up once in a while, try not to. Participation. 20% of your grade. Now, you can not participate, although we're going to make you uncomfortable. We'll probably call on you anyway. 
a wise person starts participating and they know what they can answer is right, all right? But we might call on you. But some students don't like to participate and they want to stay quiet. So if you were to never say anything in this class, what's the highest grade you could get? 80. A low B, right? I think it's B, but it's bordering on the B minus anyway. So if you did absolutely perfectly in your written reflections, your major and short essays and the exams, hundreds on all of them, the best you could get. All right? So you need to participate. This is a dialogue. Talking with one another, discussing it. It's the rhetorical stage here of uh, your education. It's expected for you to begin to express your views in front of others. Some people don't like doing that. Okay, well, and I understand that. Uh, you're shy. Maybe you're afraid of making a mistake. Remember some of those? That's one of the reasons we started with the cave analogy. Uh, some of the things that hold us back is we're kind of uh, afraid of being wrong. That's actually not humility, it's pride. Okay, I don't want to look bad in front of others. Uh, participate. Good questions or participation. Not like, so what kind of roles did Aristotle like? But by the way, that was that would have been Machiavelli. Uh, Aristotle like Buck. <laughs> I like Buckle. Oh, I do too. That's good <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, so participate, ask good questions, even sometimes if I don't understand it. Like, say, I don't understand what Aristotle means by a formal clause, because we'll talk about the four clause. That's not an uncommon problem, and it's not easy in a way to <laughs> talk about that one. I picked the one that I think is the hardest, really. Yeah, that one was missing. Um, so ask, now when you, like, so Noah, if you were to say, what's Aristotle mean by the formal cause, if I don't understand? Um, we're probably not going to just give you the definition, all right? Probably what I'll say was, let me hear what you think it means, right? Because we want you to work with it, all right? But that's perfectly good participation, all right? Does that make sense? Any, so as we look through these things, there are different levels Really show that you're thinking about it, uh, you understand it, uh, maybe even apply it to some contemporary issue. That's the highest level. Another level, a bit lower, is understanding the author's argument. Just, yeah, I get it, I understand it, and I can explain it. Uh, knowledge of the basic content. For example, when Aristotle mentions the four causes, you, you know those four causes, or at least can name one or two of them. That sort of basic content. And then just having the Bible, reading and assignments ready at the beginning of class. If you come to class without your Bible, your liturgy, and after a while you're going to have your liturgy memorized just by doing it over and over again. Have your Bible, have your written assignment, and the reading ready to go. You get here and you go, oh, Dr. Isley, I left my binder downstairs. We'll go get it. But I'll get a tardy, won't I? Yeah. But isn't that better than getting a zero for participation that day? Right? Think along those lines. So when you're coming to class, be sure you're ready. Ready to, with your material. Okay? Uh, and points will be deducted for disruptive behavior. For example, if you bring donuts to class and don't give me a double portion, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> questions on participation. <laughs> questions. All right. Uh, short essay and major essay. Oh, I will. Oh, sure. As a hint on participation, you will come to class prepared with two things to say already by default, right? Right. Paragraph. And you will get a point, you will get participation points for that type of contribution. So you will have you have some in your pocket already. And that's you know two out of the four points you need. As long as you don't do that. Yeah, so you know, like if we ask a question like what is Aristotle's view of truth? You've written a paragraph on that. And so like if I or Mr. Boggs 
says, uh, ask, well, what is Aristotle's view of truth? And then do not start with, well, I'm probably wrong. Uh, you know, it's, I, you know, well, I, I will yell at you. <laughs> I will yell at you. <laughs> and just read it. Yeah, and just read it. I know we talked about that last time, but just yeah. read it. Yeah. Don't beat around the bush. <laughs> okay. All right, short essay. In the first quarter, students will write two 750 to 1,000 word thesis driven essays on a topic related to the discussion, readings and discussion. The first essay is due September 11th, the second, uh, October 5th. And these will be submitting and to turn it in at the assigned date. Uh, essays should be submitted to turn in at the assigned date, quote from the readings and follow the CPLS guidelines for it. So you'll have these two short essays, persuasive essays, normally, well, at least uh, thesis driven. And um, you'll need then to submit these to turn in. Was everybody able to get in? Yeah. Enrolled, everybody? You should enroll. There have been uh, some instances where they've had some difficulty. So don't delay on that. All right, so get that in. Uh, uh, we suspect it's because there's a lot of. And if you get sleepy in class, stand up. Stand up. Yeah. And by the way, what happens if you sleep in class? You get zero. Yeah. I don't care. You, you can be a genius and get a zero. Yeah. Um, and I have fallen asleep sometimes with Mr. Fox is talking. So, you know, I understand, <laughs> but you got to make the effort. <laughs> you can be glad it's not yeah. in the class after lunch. I think I'm so loud. <laughs> yeah, oh, you'll see me do. No, uh, if, if you look, the first short essay is due on September 11th, right? That is when, that's, that's the week all of these other schools are going back to school. So there's going to be a lot of people on Turn It In. And Turn It In, I mean, there, we don't have papers due Friday night at midnight anymore because that's when everyone else has their paper due. And students were submitting. Because they do not, uh, they are unwise. If they try and submit at 11:58. Yeah. It would reject it. It wouldn't process. And by the time they get it reloaded and get back in, now it's 12:01 and their paper is late. And then they call, crying, weeping. Oh, please have mercy on me. I say, God's mercy is infinite. Mine is not. <laughs> Sorry, you should have been more intelligent. You're less foolish. Uh, but we have them do in the mornings so that when fewer people ask, because turn it in will slow down really bad. So I would suggest go in, make sure you can get enrolled and all that stuff in the classes now, instead of trying to do it, you know, when everyone else is on it and they're really slow and all that stuff. So, 8 a.m. Uh, pardon? 8 a.m. 8 30. 8 it, it, it means like if you were here first block or something. You're here at school. That's when you're supposed to be here. Because that's when you would have printed out. And you'll get usually about a week's notice on these okay, for these short essays. Um, and I will say this: that uh, don't we we specifically have made these not research. Okay, don't go looking in the internet for uh, Johnny Loves Philosophy dot com. Dot WordPress dot, dot WordPress dot com. <laughs> like my stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are bad sources out there. Uh, A lot of bad sources. <laughs> more bad than good, I would say. And then you don't really know how to weed them out, except Johnny Loves Philosophy probably is not a good source. Um, they're focused on understanding what you've read. Focus on that. And even if you went to good sources like the Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy, outstanding internet source. Very. It's really meant for graduate students. In philosophy. So you would struggle much more to understand the article on truth or Aristotle in that encyclopedia of philosophy than you would the actual text. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, good. This is a question. Thanks. We hadn't got to this, but let, we can hold off for 
30 seconds maybe. We don't take breaks and great idea, but if you need to go to the restroom, you can just go, leave your phone, right? And do, do yeah, put it up there and, and uh, do your business and come right back on time for visiting, all right? So, and one at a time. We don't have five guys all of a sudden. Go ahead, Matt. In the do your business quickly, is there have been incidents in the past where someone is, uh, it's a pressing matter and one of their classmates is being selfish and lollygagging and deciding to take an unreasonable amount of time in the restroom and it causes discomfort. <laughs> so go quickly and you don't know what you're missing, you don't know what you're gonna miss yeah. in here in our discussion. We might hit on something that you'll need to know for an exam. So yeah, that's how we work on that. So it's, there's no no break, but you can just, you don't need to ask permission, just get up and leave your phone there. Because we found that it did take longer to go to the bathroom when people had their phone. Strange. For some reason, <laughs> they're, they're supposed to take it out and look at it. Yeah, yeah, I know, but it happened. So that's your first essay, it's been turn it in. And you guys have used turn it in before, so you know how that works. Major, well, you don't, uh, did you guys use anything like turn it in? Okay, maybe we can talk some more about that. But you did get the, did you get enrolled? Good, all right, we'll make sure. Then there's a, yeah, sure, Levi. Question about the short essays. Mm -hmm. When will we get the topics and questions? About a, when I give them to you. About a week or so in advance. Okay, I'm doing this. Major essay. Okay, in the second quarter, by the way, just to let you know, the kind, the beneficent, the merciful Dr. Isley, Originally, the, you guys, they had to do four short essays and the major. It's ridiculous. It is, so that's why. How easy it is. I'm just too nice. That's all. We'll see what we, I mean, that would be four 750 word essays. Yeah. When I was a student, it was a 500 word essay every week. Yeah. Every week. After a couple of months, it becomes really easy. Like you get down where you're, you're doing it actually easier. And I could say that I'm being kind and generous, but I don't want to read 500 <laughs> well, They were good. They were good, yeah, but then I have to read them. Anyway, okay, major essay. In the second quarter, each student will be responsible for writing a 1,600 to 2,000 word essay, answering an important epistemological issue. Students should use the course readings and classroom discussions to guide their answers. Once again, it's not a research paper. All three steps must be submitted to turnitin.com. The outline must follow the instructions given by the teacher. Later on, we're going to give you an example of what we mean by outline. Okay? And that's what you're to follow. Um, and the final draft must follow the MLA guidelines. Neither the due dates. Bibliography, thesis statement, and enumeration of main points. Okay. Then later, a, uh, the outline. And then finally, the final draft. Okay, And those are set in different stages. So that'll be coming, and we'll once again give you that in, in good time. All right. Questions about these? 20% on each. And you will receive feedback on your argument. Yeah. With your outline, take that into account. Um, and also, I mean, like on your short essays, on your paragraphs, we will write notes and corrections and, you know, things for you, further things for you to think about, stuff like that. Read those and take that into account, right? We don't, uh, I mean, we have had in faculty meetings long discussions about whether or not to leave comments on Turn It In. Because what we were discovering is we were working really hard and spending a lot of time giving detailed comments that were being ignored. Okay. So Which, yeah. read that kind of stuff because it's good for you to, it's good. You, you ought to. And it'll make you better students, better writers, better readers, better philosophers. Yeah. And, and, and so, like, if you've made it, you have a major flaw, even in your main point in the first step, or the uh, outline, and I, or Mr. Boggs, well, be, I'm going to be doing grading major essays. 
um, if I write comments about you need to correct this, and then the essay comes across and they haven't hasn't been done, or you didn't talk to me and say, no, I think I should go this way at least, you know, um, I'll just say, well, okay. You know, we, we're really trying to help you with these things, trying to help you with and outlines, the better job you do on your outline, do a good job on your outline. It doesn't take much effort to write. All righty. That is true. Midterm and final exam. Okay, so this may be a bit different kind of exam for you all than you're used to. Uh, a midterm and final exam will be given at the end of each quarter, so they're 10% each. By the way, think about that. You guys, exams put a lot of pressure on you. You worry about them, and rightly so, you should do well. But notice, the major essay is worth the, the uh, grade of both exams. All right, just a, just a point there. Um, these exams will consist of two sections. The first will be an objective test on philosophers, schools of thought, key terms, and the timeline. It's going to be a very brief part. Um, and so, what we got, did you, maybe I do back here. Well, this is, yeah, go ahead. we were running into problems where people were like, uh, were John Calvin and Plato contemporaries? <laughs> uh, and things like that, or just not, I mean, there are certain definitions that are good to know and useful to know, like idealism or realism, um, stuff like that. And uh, what we were finding is that if we weren't uh, explicitly evaluating them, evaluating students on whether or not they knew it, uh, they weren't bothering to learn it. But those are terms that you need to know. You need to be able to identify, uh, you know, if you read somebody, uh, you need to be able to be able to identify if they're more of an idealist or more of a realist. That's gonna help you understand their philosophy. Uh, so that's what uh, this is for in you know, the, uh, the timeline. We're doing you haven't printed out i saw them or was that for the seniors uh the timeline is for you to understand the just the chronological relationship of these philosophers all right take over yeah sure the chronological relationship of these philosophers um the test, and so then that's going to be you know, fill in the blank, short answer, stuff like that. Just rattle that stuff off. Um, and then the second portion will be uh, essays, essay questions. So the way that we run our exams, that portion of our exams, is you will be given eight or ten possible essay questions on the day we review. Um, and you get to take those home and look at them and think about your answers. Uh, and then you're gonna come back on test day and we are going to say you're answering these three. And then we're gonna give you some paper and you're gonna sit down and you're going to answer those three in essay form. Um, but the nice thing is that our exams are open note and open book. So you'll have access. This is why it's so important to keep your GI binder, your GI folder, organize, and why it's important to make good notes in the margins and stuff like that is because the uh, when it comes time to take tests, you need all of that stuff ready to go. Uh, I mean, it's very humorous to watch someone dig through their backpack trying to find all the paragraphs that we've handed back, and they're all crumpled up and nasty, and you know maybe it's a little bit moldy. Uh, but it is. Uh, it is, a, it is good to have them at hand for you when you take the test, All right? Because we will expect you to reference specific authors, specific ideas, uh, quotes, those types of things. Um, and the questions aren't easy. Questions are difficult. That's why we give them to you beforehand. Um, and I think last year we decided they could write an outline and bring it with them. Yeah, yeah so you can even outline your answers and bring it with you. Uh, the only real requirement is that you write the entirety of your answer in the time allotted. Okay? 
pretty easy. It's easier than what than what I had when I was in high school. That's how I it's going downhill. Uh, yes. So those three SAT answer in the hour and a half. The time allotted. So better work on it. And they need to be legible. That's a big problem. They need to be legible. Work on your handwriting. Uh, if we look at the course calendar, the schedule, you'll see we are Thursday, August 27th. We are going to be discussing the key questions in epistemology and various theories of truth. Uh, so that's where we're at. We've been doing uh, introduction. Uh, so who are we reading? Well, we're going to look at uh, the biblical view of truth and knowledge. Uh, Mortimer Adler, who's kind of one of the founding fathers of the school, at least intellectually. Um, then we're going to get into the ancient Greeks, Plato and Aristotle. We're going to read Sextus Empiricus. He was Roman. Right, he's a Roman. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to take an exam. Then we're going to move into Christian. Uh, Christian views on epistemology. We're going to read Augustine. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, be our major medieval guy. Uh, we're going to read Luther and Calvin, our Reformation. Uh, there, and then we're going to move into modern philosophy with Descartes and Hume, uh, Reed, Hearst, and Nietzsche. Uh, very exciting. So we're going to cover the gamut from 500 BC to uh, Hearst, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. I mean, fixation of belief was 1896. So... Um, a wide gamut, 2,500 years of thought. Uh, so we're not covering everything. We're not hitting everything. Um, like Immanuel Kant is very important, but we're not uh, discussing them because there's not a lot of time. And neither of us are experts in Kant. <laughs> and you really have to be to explain them to others. Uh, it's, it's not bad. It's what, confusing. What? And he wrote poorly. Yeah. But he's very influential. <laughs> Uh, no. um, class, uh, and then final exams in uh, December. Yep. And then Christmas. Yay, Christmas. Yeah, amen. Um, so anyway, and you've seen about class meetings, attendance, etc. We talked about that. Just a, a little bit on uh, late work. So like for these daily assignments, these paragraphs. Turn them in, submit them in class on that day. If you do not turn them in that day, 50% off. And if you don't get it in by the next class, it's zero, right? Uh, and it's just, this is daily assignments pretty much, all right? So you want to get those in. Um, the uh, grades for the essays, short and major, reduced 25%. Okay? That makes sense. See where we are. All right. Um, I think 11:40. So I think I'm going to hand these key questions out, but I think I'd rather have you talk about group stuff. Okay. All right. I'm going to uh, distribute something we'll look at later uh, called key questions in epistemology. So you want to put this in your folder. And we will look at those later. Okay. All right, let's hand out these two sheets. They're not stapled, but make sure you get those. There will be extra. You may.
I do notice it's going to be on the nature of truth and detail. First question, key question is, what is truth? Okay, so that's what we're working on. Okay. Okay, if I move this, surely. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot all about it. Thank you. Are there extras? Do you have both? It was two pages for each. Do you have two sheets? Uh oh, -uh, there we go. This is why it's important to listen. Do you have two sheets? Yeah. I thought the first one. Oh, I don't know. I'm going to Okay, everyone else. Here's yeah. on the nature of truth, and then the second page, Thomas Aquinas. Ghosts. Do it if you want to, you know, follow along. Okay. Uh, would somebody open their Bibles to John? Levi, why were you not a friend? <laughs> John 1. <laughs> John 18, 33 to 38. That was quick. All right, Max, you go ahead and read that. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord or did others say to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priest. I delivered you. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. Since my kingdom was for this world, my servants would have <laughs> my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over the Jews to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then how it says it, are you a king? Jesus answered, You said that I'm a king, to the purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is Everyone who is of the truth listens to me. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And he said this. He went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find them guilty. Very good. So, we have Pilate asking this question What is truth? Right? He's talking to Jesus, judging him, seeing if he's going to uh, give in to what the Jewish leaders want him to do and crucify Jesus or at least punish him in some way. Uh, and Pilate's trying to sort out what's going on, right? And he's trying to find something that is it's legal. Right? So are you a king? Because if you're like, if Jesus is like, yeah, I'm a king, and you'd be like, well, you're, you know, a traitor to the Roman Empire, you're an insurrectionist or you're something. Oh, I have justification, I can do this. Um, she says, my kingdom is not of this world. Right? It's obvious it's not, so you have no problem with me. And Pilate eventually gets so frustrated, he's not getting the answer he wants. What is truth leads? So if only he had stuck around, and we could have solved this problem long ago. But the question that we really need to worry about is, and for the purposes of this course especially, what do we mean when we say something is true? That's important. If we call something true, we have to be able to say why and what that means. Are we saying that it's what I want to be true? It's my truth. Are we saying it's scientifically proven? Saying it's 
that what are, what are we saying? What do we mean when we say something is true? Well, there are some things that help us with this, right? and we're describing the nature of truth. That's what's important, right? Sometimes when we think of truth, we think of it like a it's a, a one thing. Right? But we're talking about the nature of truth. But again, what is it to be true? What does that mean? How does that look? Uh, and there are some things that help us with this. One of them is the law of logic. Watch unfortunate. I must take it away from you yet again. Again. Yes, again. Siri went off last Siri class. Well. Back some. No, Siri to go. Mm -hmm. Just... The laws of logic. Uh, so we have a couple we're going to talk about. Uh, we have the law of the excluded middle. It's Aristotle and his metaphysics, which we will read out of. Is there cannot be an intermediate between contradictories, but of one subject, we must either affirm or deny any one predicate. So, if, what does that mean? Well, for any proposition, it must be either true or false. There is no middle ground. So, P or not P. So if I say um, the it's markers, it's always markers. If I say this marker is pink, is that true or is that false? It is false. Now, if I say this marker is blue, that is True. Would it be appropriate to say this marker is blue and you go, well, from a certain point of view, it could be something else. No, it is either or, right? It's an either or proposition. The law of the excluded middle states for any proposition, it is either true or false. Questions? Law of excluded middle. Does that sound familiar? Logic. Law of non contradiction. Aristotle again in his metaphysics. It is impossible for the same thing to belong and not to belong at the same time to the same thing in the same respect. Right. So the law of non contradiction states a proposition cannot be both true and false at the same time, in the same place, and in the same manner. Or, P cannot equal not P. True, either true, either P or not P. P cannot equal not P. Okay? So these are laws of logic we need to accept. Something is either true or false, and if something is true, its opposite cannot also be true, right? It is true this marker is blue, right? So if the marker is blue, the marker is, the marker cannot also be not blue. Okay, make sense? Lauren, make sense? Yeah, no, no. It, it's <laughs> Zach, Nathan, Nathan, Noah, Nathan said something. <laughs> Joe, makes sense. So, Jacob, 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 Jacob. Well, your eyes are broken. <laughs> you have a bionic eye. It's just yeah. calibrating. Yes. What about? Um, Say, for example, looking at a cylinder from one point of view, the shape is that of a square. From another, same. it's that of a circle. Same, same, manner. Manner. same, um, same place. Same place. Those qualifications are very important. But wouldn't that 
Couldn't that be uh, like the excluded middle? Because therefore, if someone was to say it's a circle, someone else could say it's a square. <laughs> no, because their perspectives are different. They're not looking at it in the same manner. Okay. Right? Yeah. It has to be from the same okay. vantage point on. Objects are the easiest examples, but they can also get tricky. But it has to be, you know, the observation has to be the, the same, all things being equal. Okay. Any questions? Comments, concerns, Scott? Do you have any concerns? Not. About this. No. All right. We don't care. All right. So now on to some general theories of the nature of truth. Uh, that's right. There are disagreements. Fun. So the correspondence theory of truth states truth is that which corresponds to reality. So what tells you what truth is? Reality, very good. Mortimer Adler, uh, who we will read, and we will read this, right? the three, it's out of our reader, uh, says, when I assert that which is, is, or that which is not, is not, my assertion is true. Now, he did rip this off Aristotle. That's okay. Uh, Thomas Aquinas says, a judgment is said to be true when it conforms to the external reality. So it deals with determining the truth value of our statements or utterances about reality, right? So for example, classic, classic one, snow is wet. It's kind of your, one of your go-to examples, so snow is wet. Just a real quick point here we run into. So when we ask for the correspondence theory of truth, say that truth is that which Corresponds to reality. I think sometimes students think that's redundant. No, it's not, because that's why it's called the correspondence theory of truth. Okay. Some and, and students have thrown in other things like aligned with, or correlates, correlates, or matches, or there's another. There's another one I can't remember. Consistent with all of those. You probably understand what you're meaning, but they can be taken other ways. Right, and that's an important point when we are working in this kind of philosophy space. The words we choose to use are very important. Right? Because we're trying to communicate clearly. Uh, a note most of you, if not all of you, will receive on your first short essay is clarity. You need to be clear with what you are saying. Uh, now, it's not necessarily your fault. You need practice, but... That is an important thing. Uh, so the correspondence theory of truth is the it is the relationship of the content of our statements to the world, right? Because when we make a truth statement, right, the truth value of our statements, right, we're talking about things that we say, the relationship between that and the world. Okay, questions on this? Jacob? No. Sure? Yep. Right. Uh, the coherence theory of truth. We won't run into this one explicitly, but we do see it crop up. I mean, sexist and curious. Mm -hmm. It has it in a way. Uh, you can see it. Yeah. Uh, that's very much connected with the law of non-contradiction. Yeah. yeah, it's it's uh, subordinate to correspondence. Well, that's the way I look at it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, a belief is true if and only if it is part of a coherent system of beliefs. Okay, so you are judging the <coughs> uh, the truth value of a statement in relation to the truth values of related statements. 
whether or not it agrees with them, whether or not it contradicts them. So H.H. H. Uh, Joaquim, who is a uh, who's a French philosopher, truth in its essential nature is systematic coherence, which is the character of a significant whole. That's a statement of this theory. Um, so the question you're asking is, are the beliefs coherent in their relationship to each other? Do they fit? So it's like a, it's like a puzzle. Uh, so you are, do all these pieces fit together? If a statement fits into the puzzle and, and locks in, then it's true. If it doesn't, then you're going to have to do something to that statement, either discard it or tear a piece off or something. Okay, do you see how that works? Yes. So like, if you and I have two different beliefs, like not opposing beliefs, if they fit together, then you can say that they're both true. If you think that what Ethan thinks is important enough to be included in that system of beliefs. But you, you've identified something interesting about this. So it's about the content, the relationship between the content of our statements and the content of our wider belief system. So then you have the question, so like with the correspondence theory of truth, the question is, what is reality? With the coherence theory, it is, what's the system of beliefs that you're using? Right, there's a... Um, Rorty, Richard Rorty argues, uh, we won't read him, he's like a postmodern pragmatist. I initially studied him from the pragmatic perspective, but I, apparently a lot of philosophers seem he's postmodernist. But he, which is, I can, I can see it, I understand it. Uh, but he argues that uh, we ought to have an ethnocentrism about truth your society and culture that you grow up in, you just accept that to be true. But someone else, so that's the system of beliefs. Do your beliefs fit into that? Someone else who grew up elsewhere and in a different society and culture might have a different belief system, but it is just as valid as yours. So it's this odd, odd way of looking at it from our perspective. Um, but does that make, does that sound familiar? Someone's belief being, it doesn't matter what someone else believes, it's what you believe or, or uh, you know, your truth. That's your truth. This is my truth. You ever heard that? Of the universalist. It's similar to the universalist. Uh, depends on what you mean by universalist. Yeah. Uh, right, so it's about content of our statements, content of our statements. So. The judge of what is true is the system as a whole. Uh, so it's kind of, it keeps itself, it's supposed to keep itself internally consistent. Then we have the pragmatic theory of truth, the pragmatic conception of truth. So I prefer it. Uh, if we state it simply, truth is what works. Uh, William James says, true ideas are those we can validate, corroborate, and Verify false ideas are those we do not. Um, so validate, corroborate, and verify. Those are all words that we get from what subject? Where are, we, where are you most likely to hear those words? In yeah, science. This is not surprising. The guy that came, the first the guy that invented pragmatism, who we will, we will read, Charles Peirce, he was a chemist. And it's a pursuit of like a scientific theory of truth. Um, practical value of true ideas is thus primarily derived from the practical importance of their objects to us. Um, so it is about um, how useful an idea is. It is a useful idea to say the sky is blue. So we'll just accept that this that we will call it true that the sky is blue. But that could change if 
another statement about the color of the sky becomes more useful. Okay, so this is a dynamic theory of truth. It changes based on your circumstance. It changes based on uh, what's going on in the world around you, all of that stuff. Uh, it's also quite mercenary. What can be considered true is dependent on the environment in which the individual is operating. And it's about the content of our statements to, and its relationship to the effects in the world. Right, so I could say, uh, you know, it is true that if I step out of the window, I will fly. But what are the effects in the world of that? Not helpful, right? It is not beneficial to me. It doesn't work, so I can say it's false. <laughs> sure. Sure. Usually we call that falling. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is not a subtraction problem. So questions on this one? We talk about this one. Yeah. Do you have a question? I said, yeah. On this kind of one, on the over to the truth. Get it from the line here. Right. So you need to get up. Here you have your first reading. Oh, yeah. Okay, and it's actually not from your reader. Oh, you're dealing with the uh, biblical approach to truth and knowledge. Okay, so I'll explain this once we get a note. All righty, so here's the assignment. Uh, read page four, both sides, and stop at the biblical understanding of truth, knowledge, and truth, New Testament. Yes, you didn't get one. Oh, sure. Bad joke. You seen that back. Sorry about that. All right, so first four pages, stopping at the uh, New Testament. All right, got that? And you will now write two paragraphs in response to these questions. First one, explain how the correspondence theory of truth and the biblical theory of truth, the view of truth, are compatible. And this also is on red letter. Explain how the correspondence theory of truth and the biblical view of truth are compatible. All right, so how they're compatible. That's the first one. Uh, and I'd recommend writing these down. Uh, some of you have been trained just to do RenWeb. It doesn't always work for you. So, so there is that one. Paragraph needing a quotation. Second one. Write about something that you learned, you found interesting, perhaps a question you have. Quotation, and then your why it was interesting, maybe why it was something new to you, something maybe you didn't understand, all right? So, everybody got the reading? Know what pages to read and what you're to write on. And those are due. Monday morning. And 10.